Monday morning, and I'm so excited because I have a CWI representative. Can you please introduce yourself? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Luis Caloca. I'm the Director of Admissions and One Stop Operations at CWI. And I love One Stop, and I like the way you have a lot of, because I have several CWI students that I work with, and one Stop is a way for you to understand the admissions process because it still can be a little confusing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and so there's everything in there, every opportunity. And if you can't figure it out online, you can give them a call and actually someone answers, which is awesome. So um, are, did you develop that or how did you come to CWI? I actually started at Boise State. I was one of the employees that transferred over as part of the Larry Selland College of Applied Technology transition. Oh, okay. I was one of the first, and I transferred in July of 2008 before we had employees. Wow. Before we had a college, really. I mean, as soon as the voters voted, technically there was a college, right? But you can't just vote and have everything happen on its own. So I was one of the, the early pioneers, we call ourselves, that helped make decisions like, how do we want to implement the institution? Do we want to have separate offices? Do we want to have, at, at this time it was revolutionary, right? A one stop. Yeah. And ultimately we decided that we need an institution where students can come to one place to get their questions about admissions, financial aid, registration. Yes. Student accounts, yeah. all of that because at the time, and, and it's still present today, Idaho is still, in terms of college going and college completion, right, we struggle. And As we in want... every state. I work with kids from across the United States, and I can tell you, you are not alone. You are not alone, but I really like what's happening. So one of the things when you're on the college light bulb is I have to ask you, and we're going to talk a lot about CWI because there's some exciting things that you will want to know. But first off, I have to find out I like to know what was your educational path. Well, yeah. So my path was um, I started in the fields. Uh, I started at the age of twelve, working in the potato fields, and uh, I still remember that first day. Uh, I only lasted a half day. Uh, it was trudging through the fields, through dirt, vines, and it was my job to go behind the machine, the harvester, and, and pick up what was left because it left a lot of a lot of product. And that product is valuable. And um, I remember that by the end of midday, there I was crying. And and my dad's like, all right, you can go home. But tomorrow, you're going to tough it out all day. And and really, from that point forward, it was just, you know, in and out of the fields, doing the potato harvest, weeding. And uh, I did that until the age of 18, the summer before I was going to head out to college. And I still remember that last day, we were weeding an onion field. And somebody was killing all the onions. So at that point, we had to take out our knives and get on our hands and knees to do weeding. And it was really at that point where it it just kind of hit me that I'm ready to go on to college. I'm admitted. And, you know, my parents have done this work to allow me this opportunity. I can't I can't do this anymore. I, I need to honor that. So you were going to high school while you're working in the fields. In the summers, in the yeah. summers, and then seasonally, you know, yeah. different harvests like the onions and jalapeno. Uh, so in March, typically, we'd start picking up a few hours in the okay. evenings after school. Yeah, and then summer, it was nonstop. Wow, that's impressive. You learned how to work hard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that I did. Yes. Yeah. So you, and where did you graduate? What's From Valley Okay, and that's in, is that Nampa? Caldwell. Caldwell, yeah. okay. Rural Caldwell, that's... Okay, so I um, so you're you get accepted to college. How was that college process? Did you under so were you where were you going to college? It was a rough start, I'll tell you. I um, I had actually missed the admission deadline at Boise State. Okay, and it was thanks to some people that they they saw potential in me, and they really held my hand. Uh, they helped me petition to get into the institution. I mean, luckily I had I had taken my ACT had a really good GPA, uh, and um, it was the CAMP program at that time, the College Assistance Migrant Program at Boise State, that advocated for me, and they were able to still get my foot in the door, even though uh, I I think it was late July by the time I finally rolled around around to that process, because 
I didn't have anyone, know. right? I mean, yeah. you don't know what you don't know. There was really no one to look to. And that's that's partly why I decided to work for higher ed, you know, because of my own experience struggling to get my foot in the door. And um, I, I kind of feel that it's my mission to help others because I struggle. I don't want them to struggle. Well, and I think that people, you know, you're focused on what you should have been focused on as a student. You were focused on getting good grades having good attendance, I'm sure. You probably yep, didn't did. ever miss school. unless It was you were, rare. Yeah, yeah, deathly ill. And you really, uh, and, and so you were thinking, and you took your ACTs, you were thinking that that is all you needed to do. I have, over the past years, I've been in Boise since 2014, and I have been shocked at the amount of seniors who come in who they're in the same boat whether they were are from a lower income family, higher income family, middle income families, they are all experiencing this we didn't know what we didn't know and they've missed major deadlines and so I because my background is school counseling, I I take them. And I that's why I think I'm so impressed with the one stop how it is set up. It is it's exactly what you said. It's even at Boise State, and it's it's not a criticism, but it would be great for them to rethink it, get everything in the same building and stop making it so difficult and stop having offices not talk to each other. And that, that's a huge problem with kids, and that oftentimes will make them feel like they want to drop out. Well, I can't even get through to my first semester because I forgot to sign one piece of paper or this didn't happen or the school made an error on my paperwork and it's being held up. It's fascinating how. So that's good. I like that. So then, so you get to Boise and what did you study? Well, I'm trying to remember what my first major was. Okay. I think it was poli sci and then computer science somewhere in there. Um, education for a while. I think I stuck with that one the most. And um, I think what I appreciate most about that experience is that the institution did a really good job of getting me out into the classroom early. And what I recognized is that teaching is tough and it does not come naturally to me. Yeah. So I decided to switch my major and because I had taken a lot of Spanish courses as part of my bilingual education major, mm -hmm. uh, I decided to graduate with Spanish and at the time, I was doing a lot of translating, so it, it seemed to fit for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed to fit, and I graduated in 2002 and uh, decided to go back to primarily because I, part of me felt like I had taken the easy way out because, I, I mean, I knew some Spanish, and, and it definitely increased my proficiency, especially in terms of writing, speaking, and, and presenting in front of a group. But part of me also felt that I needed to do more and as I started working for the institution in higher ed, I also recognized that I needed to do something that was more in alignment with where I was headed. And you hit a glass ceiling. Yes. So I, I, by luck or desire, when I did go back to school, I ended up the same thing, taking a lot of educational courses, but I did not want to be a teacher. I have taught at the college level. I actually enjoy that a lot. Um, I, I just really love education. No one had ever suggested school counseling. It was when I was at a job, my boss, I was working in a prison, um, a girl's uh, correctional facility, and my boss said, you should be a school counselor. And I thought, what is that? <laughs> and I, you know, when I looked it up, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is, you're super a part of education, but you're, you have a different role. There's a lot of action. So oh, yeah. you, you must have a lot of the same you must like a lot of the same. You like that you have new people coming in all the time and that they complete something. And yes, you say goodbye to them, but it's, it, it's, it's okay. So you, so how long have you been in this? Well, did you go for what, what is your master's? In public administration. Perfect. Yeah. That was probably, so how did you decide that? Well, I knew that I wanted to work for, continue working for nonprofits and had it been my preference locally, I would have sought out a higher ed administration degree. Okay. But that didn't really exist. This was the closest that I could come to that is nonprofit administration. And they had a public policy emphasis, a general degree. And I'm like, well, public policy isn't really my thing. So I decided to go general. 
Okay. Yeah. Now, was it, I found my master's degree to be a completely different experience. There wasn't a class I didn't love, even the harder ones. There wasn't a book that I didn't like reading. It was amazing. Did you have that experience at the master's level? What I did, but I also think it's because I was a very different student. Uh, I was an awful student as an undergrad. Uh, I was way too involved. I, because of my success in high school, I didn't recognize that college is a transition. And that's another thing that I tend to do in my work is educate students on the differences, mm -hmm. right? You, you can't just do that fly by night studying, memorize everything the day before and expect to do well on the exam. That may have worked in high school, does not work in college, right? So my first year, I had a 1.6 GPA. Ah. It was ridiculous. I lost everything, right? And I share this story with students that are coming in. Yeah. And like, it's different. Let's talk about the differences and what yeah. you can do to do it better than I did. So my master's, I, by that time, knew how to study, recognized that I needed to look over my notes consistently, actually take very good proficient notes. And I graduated with a 3.85. Oh, that's awesome. Master's degree. Yeah. No, it is super important. I really encourage kids to not study in their room, to find a place at the college and have that be your spot. And I encourage them to not calculate how many times they can miss school because you're going to get sick. You're oh, yeah. in a germ pool. And I, and I, you know, most of the people that work with me by their second year, they're like, I am going to go to every single class because when I do get sick, then I, it's not, you know, it doesn't, mark them underneath. And I think the colleges do have to hold them accountable for attending class. You know, I think that's because that's what it is in the job, in that's the right. world of the job that has to be. So I think that's great that you run it that way. So how large is One Stop? Which we're going to have to go in and we're going to do some filming in One Stop to just kind of validate how awesome it is. Because I, I people don't always know what it means. Like, what for is sure. this? And, and when, you, when you say large... What do you mean by large? Well, how many people work in one stop? How many people? Oh, okay. So you're the head of it. Mm -hmm. And you have it sounds like because you transitioned in 2000, when did you say? 2009? Uh, 2008. 2008. Sorry. So you've been able to develop that program. Oh, gosh. I, you know, I'd have to go through the org chart in my head. Uh, because we have an ADA location at uh, Oberlin and Maple Grove. We have mm -hmm. the Micron location, which is, say, the flagship. Uh, the Canyon County Center, we also offer limited services out there. And then we have all of the staff that are answering the phone, answering emails. Uh, wow. So wait a minute, you don't scary. have to go to your site. You're, you, which site do you work at? Or do you work at all of them? Do you float? You could possibly find me at any one of those. Oh, uh, Especially in August when we are at our busiest. And for any students that are coming to CWI, I highly encourage you to get everything settled early and not come in August. Because typically during the course of the week, we'll serve anywhere from two to 300 students in person, uh, another two to 300 over the phone. In August, that traffic increases sevenfold. Wow. We'll see about 1,400 students a week. So you can imagine what the wait times might look like. Yeah. You know, I think one of the hardest concepts for a lot of students, because it is the world of texting, is that they have to check their college email. Oh, yeah. Them. Yes. And, and that's where they're communicating. So one of the, the little tricks that we do, which is very helpful, and I'm, you know, I, I'm sure you probably encourage it if you don't. This is one of the things I've found with my clients. It's extremely helpful is to have their regular email their, um, you know, it's usually on their phone, but to have their college email forwarded to their regular email. Yes. And that has been a very successful strategy for them to realize, oh, my gosh, I have to check my email. So that's so important. And that's how the teachers, how your professors, how they have to communicate. So that's really oh, yeah. that's really great. Yeah, we mentioned that at every single session at our orientation on Saturday with the parents and the students. We couldn't say it enough. You never yes. can. Yeah. So uh, the um, so you have your degrees, you're using your degrees, which is cool, because we haven't found that a lot. And um, what would you suggest if someone wanted to? Because I encourage people to look at at 
jobs that are on campuses, especially if they're going on for their masters. I said, it's a great, you know, you've got all the community of educators. It's actually a really great place to hone skills. And uh, there's several jobs on campuses that are, you know, it's useful that you can do while you're studying. And so um, were you, you were working full time when you were getting your master's degree. Correct. Okay. So, and you were working your way up at the College of Western Idaho? Uh, at that time, I was, let's see if that was in 2010. Yes. I started my master's degree when I was at Boise State, finished when I was at CWI. Okay. And so did that just really open up some doors for you? Oh, it did. Uh, I would not have been able to apply for this the position that I'm in now without that master's degree. That was a requirement, minimum requirement. And so you're bilingual, which is awesome. Now, you were talking about struggling in Spanish, though. So while you spoke Spanish, I'm assuming you spoke Spanish, but was I it did. a dialect or was it? A... No, it was just uh, I never took any Spanish classes in high school. I was really focused on other things and uh, I didn't necessarily speak it a lot. And it's one of those things, right? I think with any language, if you don't speak it frequently, and especially if you never write it, I never wrote in Spanish, you can only get to a certain point. So yeah, at college, I had more of that formal training that really helped, helped me advance. So you had the speaking part down mm -hmm. because you probably were around it enough to hear it Correct. or not. And that's one of our, you know, my fabulous camera guy, Nias, who goes to College of Western Idaho. He, that's his same problem is that he, he, I think that's a great way to put it. Yeah. So we are actually committing to a Spanish class because I took French all through school. And of course, French was identified at, at, when I was in school that that was going to be the language, the second language. And um, so they were teaching it in Connecticut by second grade. So wow. I had, had, I've had French that long. But and it's it it actually helps me to understand Spanish. But I need to we we need to hunker down and really yeah. it's valuable. It's a great second language to have. Yeah. I don't know that I'll ever be able to write it. I'm certainly sure that I will not be able to spell well in it because I cannot spell well in English. As, <laughs> so well, this is tricky. You know, at, at uh, least with Spanish, language. all of the vowels yeah. are present all day, every day. Yeah. yeah. So that is great that you're. So now you you do have a handle on the Spanish language. You, I, I noticed on one of your, um, I think it was a Facebook post that you, or no, it was LinkedIn mm -hmm. where um, you were giving a Spanish admissions, which I, and it looked packed. So that is wonderful. I think that's a really important part. Um, you must, did, how do you work with refugees? Because I know I encourage a lot of refugees to seek out opportunities with CWI, yeah. um, and so how do you work with transitioning them? So with refugees, we tend to see refugees primarily at our Ada County location. Okay. So we have, you could say that at our Nampa campus, we focus on the population that we're going to expect from there, right? So there is a, a very uh, large number of Spanish-speaking um, individuals in that area. So we kind of focus on that there, whereas Boise, very different story, right? We have people from all sorts of backgrounds, languages, and our Ada group tends to focus on them. So we reach out at uh, places like Boise High, Capitol High, mm -hmm. Bora, right? We already see large concentrations of those students, and we work with the high school counselors there to have sessions specifically for those groups, especially recognizing that they might require a little more one-on-one -on -one assistance. And then from there, uh, we have a refugee organization, refugee slash international student organization that we just started up. And we have one of our Ada team, member, well, somebody from my team is leading that team, as well as an advisor and a couple other members. And they just have very informal at first, right? Informal conversations, the opportunity for them to, to air just anything that they might be struggling with as they're trying to get their foot in the door. Yeah. And to recognize that they have different issues. And yeah. I mean, many, I, when I, I, because I work with refugees myself and, um, I several of the moms talk about how, oh, before we get here, they said everything's free, everything's free. Well, it's not. Yeah. And even college isn't. And so there's a way um, that that was a huge shock for a lot of students that um, they think, oh, I want to go to I, I want to go to a four year college. Well, they can't afford it. So the um, going to a community college and getting 
their feet wet and understanding it's different from the high school setting, that's very, very helpful. And they, and they can continue to develop themselves and work, and it's, it's important. And the majority of my students work while they're in school. Whether it's a 10-hour job, I always like to have them do 10 hours. It, it's, it's good for them to build their portfolio. It's good for them to have a little cash in hand and to, to put skin in the game. Now, some have to work more than others. but So you're using your degree. So if someone wanted to become an admissions counselor, an admissions director, so what would be the advice? What would you recommend? Now, I would tell them to come work for us. As a student, <laughs> right? We, we have been really lucky in that. We've had some amazing work studies. Uh, we have presidential ambassadors to be one of our enrollment counselors. And how did she find that out? She found that out by, by doing tours, giving presentations, finding that she really enjoyed that type of work. I'm like, great, let's help you get there. And when she graduates for, with her associate's degree, She'll be graduating uh, here next term. We'll get her in the pool and provide her with opportunities to compete and see if she wins out. But she's had a lot of training. I think she would be a very competitive candidate. And she can continue to 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 attend a school. Oh yeah, at a reduced rate. Oh, so yeah. that and and that's one of the things that I talk about with people is that when you get on a campus, sometimes it's after a first semester. Um, they might have different limitations. They might say, if you come on at this job, you need to stay at this job while you're studying, which I think is very fair. They have all kinds of reasons why. Um, but I think it's a great opportunity to be able to have a job, usually have benefits, and continue with your education and really um, work on taking classes that will really help you in it. So that's wonderful. So there's some Extra announcements that I talked about. So one of my frustrations, so I've been in the educational field for quite a long time, and and I have my college success coaching where I work with college students, um, and I have found that one of the biggest frustrations has been, especially in this area, that if they took classes from CWI or North Idaho College or um, South uh, why can't I think of it, College of Southern Idaho, mm -hmm. that there were not articulation agreements that allowed them to transfer everything. So maybe only four of their 12 classes that they took would transfer. So you have an announcement to make. Oh, That's sure, yeah. So um, we found out a few months ago that, and by we, uh, I'm referring to the larger set of institutions, public institutions. Uh, the state board came down and said, we see that one institution has anatomy, whatever the number is. Another institution has biology 227. There's confusion. Things aren't aligning. People are saying the situations you just presented, not all my credits are transferring. We need you all to get on the same page. And that's exactly what we've been asked to do. And what we're following forward with is all general education courses have to be in alignment. They'll all be numbered the same, they'll be titled the same. It will be the same course regardless as to which institution you are receiving that course from. And I think that is fantastic because that will create a situation where if you get accepted into the Idaho system and are able to do as many of your courses as possible at CWI, you'll be able to afford college. There are some kids who think I have to take a couple of years off and I have to earn some money and save it, which is very challenging to do. Yeah, for sure. It's very challenging to put aside that much money. And if you put aside too much money, it oftentimes impacts your financial aid. So now you'll be assured that if you start at CWI, you can then transfer over to Boise State and you can create a situation where you're going to be saving quite a bit of money. Yeah, or even if they don't start with us. Uh, I know that there's a lot of students that go to University of Idaho, come home for the summer. Same thing, ISU, come home for the summer. They yep. take class with us, still make progress at a lower cost. At a lower cost, yeah. maybe graduate a year earlier. Right. And so that is fantastic. That is really, really good news because that has been a big concern of mine. And I know um, that, that when I give presentations, people ask me that all the time. Is it cheaper for us to start at... Uh, 
at the community college. And it's not just the value of being cheaper. Okay. So we like to use affordable. Affordable. More affordable. I like that word. <laughs> uh, so, but there are pieces, not, you have to take, I always say to parents, okay, you have four kids, three kids, six kids. And depending upon financially where the parents are at, they might be in the process of purchasing a business or expanding. You don't always have uh, just this tons of money available to you. You may um, be experiencing taking care of your adult parents. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of impacts on financial, and it's very expensive. College has gone up tremendously from even the time where you were in school, oh, the yeah. time that I was in school. So sometimes it is in their best interest to, um, and even maturity-wise. Like you said, maybe if you had started at the community college, you would have been able to dip your feet in without getting your your GPA down so low. That is really hard to recover when your GPA is so low. Oh, yeah. I harp on that with the students when I share my story, too. Yeah. So even if you were on point maybe for your junior and senior year, it probably was super challenging to get it to even move the needle. So, um, but it sounds like you do, you continue to do leadership. And that's one of the things that I talk about students is you should be continually developing your portfolio. So you need to look at, you're at a community when you are at a college. And so what can you do for leadership? I like them to select at least one club to get involved with or one leadership position and to continue to develop that, to volunteer, to be part of. Um, and I know CWI is really good about this because I get your newsletters where you announce, okay, we're having an open forum. We're going to be discussing these things. Um, I like that. I think you're really inclusive and not every college is. Not every college wants feedback from students. So I really like the way you uh, do that. And I know Nias is having a great experience with uh, everything he's learning he actually is being able to implement with the business. So we yeah, we just the we love the communications program he's in and we encourage anybody else to come visit Neas and hang out for a day and see the stuff that I mean they can practice here if they would like. We want to be a um, we want to be a good partner because we really love what you're doing and it's I met you at a networking event and I was, I just said, oh, I have to go up and see him because <laughs> that was fun. We were at the Hispanic chamber yeah, and that was really, really impressive. The stuff that's going on. And I was so glad when they announced CWI, <laughs> you shouted out. That was great. So what, um, what new things are going on other than this whole being able to have be assured that your classes are going to transfer. What else is new and happening at CWI? I know that um, your IT degree now is articulated with Boise State. You have an IT. Um, There's, oh gosh, I think four of them, if I remember off the top of my yeah. head. I had they were working hard to get ones. that implemented, and I think in January it was approved. So that is a really good plus. Because one of our other interns is going to participate in that program. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So, is there any other thing? Um, I think people don't realize that there's different sites. Believe it or not. Oh yeah. Yep. And that's important. We we still come across people from Boise that don't recognize we have a campus in Boise, and that's primarily where you'll find those IT programs, our administrative support, and uh, surgical technology, dental assisting. And there's a few that are out there. Okay. Yeah. We're still working on it, but coming soon, um, we still haven't named it. But one of the things that we're really trying to help students with on the forefront is getting them to recognize that um, if transportation is an issue, if finances are going to be an issue, right? How do we as an institution inform ourselves of those struggles? before they become a problem and prevent the student from going to class and leading to things like withdrawal. So we're starting a student inventory that gets at those things so we can have those advising and counseling sessions early. Uh, so that's still in the works and we're-, we're Because you know, and this, this really irritates me too, it just does, but you actually have a good system. Many colleges do not recover this whole. So if it's the first year that you're taking out a student loan, 
it doesn't get released till after the semester starts. Okay. And I cannot tell you how many students, especially adult students who are going back to school, cannot afford books. And your library actually allows them, if they have financial aid that's coming, they are allowed to get their books. Many colleges don't do that. So you have adult students who are already nervous about going back to school and they don't have their books and they have no, it's not like you can hang out at school because many of them have children and they have lives. So I love that CWI helps with that. Yeah. So that's, you know, one step of many and we are piloting that this fall, piloting that student inventory with a group of students. And if all goes well, and we suspect it will, and we'll roll that out to every newly admitted student for the following fall. Oh, that'll be good. Well, I like all these new opportunities that you're, you're creating a situation where people will have a good relationship and, and feel strong about being able to go back to school. Because my first experience at school, I left after two weeks. And then Ooh. I waited, I went to a tech program, I became a barber, I bought a business, and that all worked out really well in that sense. Um, however, when I did start going back to school, I still wasn't getting the right and proper guidance. And I know that I didn't um, create, I, I just, it was through grit that I got through it and fantastic teachers. I mean, they were just all so supportive of um, me going back to school. But it was, and my clients at the time, I was a barber, they were all excited for me. But it was really hard. And so I'm glad you're putting all these things together. And I was still really nervous about it. I was, I even though I ran a business, that meant nothing. It, it just, it wasn't really a transferable skill. It was very confusing, the whole college process and what to take and what not to take. And, um, you know, the only nice thing is, is in New Hampshire, where I was going at the time, everything transferred to the the University of New Hampshire. So that was a plus. Yeah, sure. So one of the things that I would love for you to work on, and maybe you already have it, is I really feel that a lot of colleges are wasting a ton of time with their university course that they're trying to expose kids. The things that I, I always have kids say to me, I wish they would teach uh, resume writing skills, how to manage our money, how to do things like that, how to note take and stay away from um, discussions on what's going on politically or, you know, I just feel that there should be an automatic course on that. And that's what the, the, the it should be focused on is huh. test taking, yeah. how to prepare yourself, executive functioning skills. Um, just I, because I constantly deal with that. And that's what I teach students. And they're like, why can't we have a course that's on that? How to network, how to network and get involved and not get so too involved that you're sure. not paying attention. Yeah, 1.6 UPA. Yeah. yeah. I get you. I mean, I usually will say, okay, let's, and a lot of times I have kids who are coming to me after a really failed, you know, difficult semester. And that's when they start working with me. And it's like, okay, tell me about your day. How does it start? And I notice that they don't know how to really take notes so that they stay in here. And I, so those are the things. That's my only suggestion. And I would love to come over and talk to you about that. <laughs> Yeah, it, you know, at this time, I know that there is no class. There used to be a class, and then they form, formulated the quid. And uh, at this point in time, it really is just separate workshops. Yeah. Workshops that aren't for college credit or anything. And, and really, yeah, the student has to go in and take the initiative. Um, and, and they may not have time because I started, I had two little children, yeah. and I had a business, and I didn't. I had to drive to the college and drive home. I didn't have time to to do that. But I know that there was a math I took that this, this teacher who actually he taught at Dartmouth college as well. And he, he did a lot of those things and it, it just made it so much easier for me to understand how to keep good notes and things like that. So I thought that was a really great, even though it was a math class, um, that was nice. How to read a book, how to take, you know, how to highlight. A lot of kids don't understand how to do that, believe it or not. They don't know what to highlight and what to focus on. So, 
Well, thank you so much. And again, it's exciting news that um, people need to rethink the College of Western Idaho. Either way, I would go for a tour. I always encourage students, especially juniors, take the time to do a nice tour, get to familiarize yourself with what the college offers and see if it is a great opportunity for you to continue with your education and potentially save money. Thank you so much.